afternoon and welcome to Green. I'm Francis Levy, Ed Nersessian and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center. Before we begin this afternoon's roundtable, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, the art show you see on the walls, which is curated by Hallie Cohen, um, who is the head of the art department at Marymount Manhattan College, and Adam Ludwig, is called The Body is Image, and it was the accompaniment to our six roundtables on sexuality that began with mating and captivity and ended last week with paraphilias. Now, this is the last day you can see this particular show, so we ask you to avail yourselves of it. And uh, there's an extension in the, in the next room, and uh, writing's on the wall. Nicholson Baker. Edward Albee, John Tintoro, Judith Thurman, and Simon Winchester will all be appearing at Philoctetes this particular fall and into the winter. So go to philoctetes.org to look at our calendar. All past Philoctetes programming can be found by simply going to past programming on the Philoctetes site. And all Philoctetes roundtables are simulcast so that if you are not able to come here, you can see it by simply going to philoctetes.org. I'm now pleased to present my good friend, David Kirkpatrick. He's senior editor for Internet and Technology at Fortune Magazine and specializes in the computer and technology industries, as well as the impact of the Internet on business and society. He is currently on leave from the magazine while writing a book about Facebook for Simon & Schuster. David will moderate this afternoon's roundtable and introduce our distinguished guests. So take it away, David. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Frank, Francis. Um, and one might say, what the heck is he doing as a technology guy moderating this? I'm not sure. But uh, I do moderate a lot. And uh, in a way, one of the great things about this subject is it's one that we all have personal experience with. So hopefully that will all come out um, in some interesting way. And it is also, in my opinion, um, a great example of the value of Philoctetes to uh, you know, be sponsoring these kinds of discussions in an ongoing way about that integrate notions of psychology and, and brain into matters of everyday life. Because right now, um, more than most times, uh, this issue of, of uh, behavior and, and uh, greed in particular is very much in public discussion. Uh, greed is so widely said to be a major reason why we are in the midst of a frighteningly and confusingly difficult financial moment. Uh, now on a global basis. Um, and so we're not really going to talk that much about the financial piece of it, although I think it'll come up uh, repeatedly in, in, in the conversation. Uh, but we're here to sort of understand what it means to talk about greed, particularly in the context of, you know, daily impact on society. And, uh, and so it, it's a very timely session. And thank you all for coming on a Sunday, which I think is a, is it a first to have a Sunday no, afternoon? Sunday. Oh, you have? Okay. Not too many. Well, I'm glad to be here on Sunday. But when the weather is bad, this is a when good the, weather day. It's a really nice day out there right now, actually. But as Frank said, you know, it's kind of a primordial topic, he said, when we were, when we were preparing for this session. Um, and it is. And I just wanted to read, um, to reiterate some of the the things that were in the description to uh, remind us all what we're here to discuss. When does wanting become excessive? Uh, and then what we call greed can be broken down into rivalry, competitiveness, aggression, insecurity, grandiosity, and poorly controlled urges, including desires to be successful, to be part of an elite club, to be admired. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things we're going to discuss uh, repeatedly probably throughout this conversation is, you know, is it really a moral question or not? I think our panelists have interesting point of view on that. So let me briefly introduce them. Uh, starting over there, uh, Lawrence Tancredi, who's a psychiatrist and a lawyer, professor of psychiatry at NYU. Uh, like all of our panelists, is an author. Uh, and uh, his... his uh, most recent book is called Behavior, What Neuroscience Reveals About Morality. And among other things, as it says, you've seen probably, he, he does uh, PET scans to study uh, people and look at what's happening when they do and feel things. Um, next to him is uh, Robert Frank, who is a visiting professor of business ethics at NYU and a columnist for the New York Times, writes a economic view column uh, periodically and has written a lot of different books and articles and essays, including uh, one that received a major award, uh, which is called The Winner Take All Society. But his, his books also have 
touched on the question of the relationship between morality and and uh, financial and uh, and uh, societal behavior. One of his books is called "What Price the Moral High Ground," uh, and next to him is uh, Jay Phelan, uh, who is a geneticist and a biologist at uh, UCLA, and. Um, his forthcoming book is What is Life? A Guide to Biology. And uh, you'll find that he's, in his most recent book, which is the book, is it Mean Genes that has the chapter from which? Yeah, his book Mean Genes has a whole chapter about greed, which I think will, uh, will come up. Uh, he sent us some excerpts, and they were pretty interesting. Uh, finally, to my left, uh, Rabbi Philip Hyatt uh, is a scholar in residence at Central Synagogue in New York. Um, and has, uh, is a scholar of, the, of, of religion and uh, morality, and uh, is writing a book right now about what young people think about moral questions. Um, so uh, I want to first start by asking each of you to just define greed as you think of it, uh, and, and, and you know briefly, if you want to throw in how you contextualize it in the present moment, although if you don't get to that in your opening comments, we can certainly get to that later. And as everybody knows, we ask everyone in the room to participate. So you know, after we've talked among ourselves for a while, we will want to hear your questions and comments. So uh, Larry, want to start with you? Well, I guess I would just take a generic position as a uh, starting point, which is a kind of selfish, compelling desire uh, for goods, mostly, I guess, money, uh, power, food, other kinds of objects that would benefit the individual uh, and that would also be at the detriment of another person. So that be essentially uh, taking goods away from somebody else or from some, other, from some other group, as opposed to, for example, someone who would just want to collect uh, clams or go out off on the beach and collect seashells, but nobody else is affected. <coughs> So my position would be, uh, would have two de dimensions to it. One would be a kind of compelling, excessive desire for objects. And secondly, it would be at the detriment of a third party. OK. That was admirably brief. You don't have to be that brief. But uh, Bob, do you want to uh, tell us how you view it? I, I didn't have any real clear instructions for what to say on the panel, but as an economist, I, I thought it would be uh, a natural role to try and take the economist's position of defender of greed. I think uh, it, it, it's not true, as a lot of Adam Smith's modern disciples seem to think, that, that he said greed always leads to good outcomes. But what was interesting about what he did say was that greed often leads to good outcomes. So, so his scheme, uh, and it's interesting that no one else, else really had this clearly thought out before he did, which wasn't so long ago. His scheme was if there's a producer competing for market share and there's some cost-saving innovation that the producer can introduce, uh, the producer's only aim is to steal business away from his rivals, but in the process of emulation and others rushing to adopt the same innovations he adopts, then you get this uh, downward movement of prices that in the end leaves the producer not much better off than before. Who was the person who said it? I didn't get it. This is Adam Smith, uh, the, the father of modern economic, well, the father of economics, writing in 1776, The Wealth of Nations. Uh, but Smith wrote an earlier book uh, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. He was quite aware that uh, greed doesn't always give you good outcomes. Uh, the interesting thing was that it sometimes does. And I think the, the real challenge for economic students is to, and for people generally, is to learn whom to get mad at when things go wrong. Uh, and, and that's why I think recently it was very strange to hear uh, John McCain, who is, as, as you all surely know, Phil Graham's disciple in matters concerning financial deregulation. He's long time himself been a, a champion of financial deregulation. Uh, John McCain has been blaming the Wall Street meltdown on greed. Uh, and that's sort of outside the narrative. If, if greed leads to good outcomes in the invisible hand story, which is Phil Graham's story, and we don't therefore need deregulation, uh, why are we worried about greed on Wall Street? Greed on Wall Street was supposed to be the force that drove good outcomes on Wall Street. 
What I think the challenge is There's is also Greenspan's argument. Yeah, Greenspan bought the same argument. Uh, now is beginning to, to re retrench a little bit. Uh, but the real challenge is to figure out when greed works for the common interest and when it doesn't. And, and typically when it doesn't, it's because of some structural imbalance where it wouldn't be expected to work in the common interest. And in that case, it's really the responsibility of the people in charge to set rules that bring incentives back in the line. And so I think it was the failure of people to adopt obvious regulations that should have been adopted that many knowledgeable observers were saying should have been adopted even long before any of this meltdown happened, that, that really is, that's the group to get angry at. Uh, don't get angry at people who were taking advantage of obvious cash on the table uh, by virtue of there being no regulations. Get, get angry at the people who ought to have known that there should have been regulations is the, is the point I would stress. So you would take it for granted that greed is going to be there, and it's just a matter of how we handle it, in fact. Yeah. It's, it's like the, what you see in a pride of lions. If there's a new dominant lion, the first thing that animal does is kill the cubs sired by other, other lions. Is that a bad thing? Well, biologists think it's a dumb question. It's neither good nor bad. That's just what the competitive imperatives dictate in that situation. And certain competitive situations dictate uh, ruthless behavior, uh, when, when that's contrary to the common good, we as humans have the power to set rules that try to rein that in. And when we don't do that, it's the people who fail to act and set the right rules, I think, they are the ones that are really responsible. Hmm. So, Jay, does that dovetail with some of your thinking or, or, or contradict it? In no, no, it absolutely does. I, I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I think about human behavior all the time. And my, my perspective is that we are an evolved organism. We are the product of natural selection. And so if I want to understand our behaviors, I have to think about them in the context of natural selection. Why is it that genes that push one behavior or another behavior would be advantageous relative to the alternatives that are present in the population. And so I think of any behavior, and it could be greed or uh, happiness. It was interesting when I wrote a chapter called Greed. I went back and forth and back and forth. Should it be called happiness, or should it be called greed, or should it be called happiness? And the very fact that they were that closely intertwined comes from the, the fact that I view happiness or greed as a tool that our genes use to induce us uh, to move towards behaviors that benefit them. And so now you, you raised the example of, of the lion and is it good or bad that, that they kill the cubs? And it is, it's an odd question, it, it, it just is, that, that's what happens. But when I think about human behavior, uh, I always felt different from other scientists because I was never moved enough just by the intrinsic beauty of the science. Uh, I'm a very selfish kind of person and I want to know how does this benefit me? How, how can it help me? And so I want to understand these issues to understand if I decide something is good or bad, right or wrong, how can I take the knowledge about what the behaviors are going to be and then modify my life. So I think of greed as something that absolutely is there, but now that I know it's there, I can take various preemptive steps so that I don't necessarily get the outcome that my genes might want. Hmm. Really? Okay. <laughs> I, want, I want to get back to some of your thinking about the genetic roots in a, in a little while. But uh, So Rabbi Hyatt, uh, when you hear the word greed, particularly in the present context of, where, where, where of our society, what, what comes to your mind, and, and what would you tell us about it? Well, first I would have to say I agree and disagree with the three panelists, but there is a point that you made that, that's quite important. There's good greed and there's bad greed. And I use myself as an example, and I, okay, uh, putting it very simply, I'm a greedy person. Uh, I don't want a lot of money. I don't take care of the stock market. I'm not a manipulator in, in uh, real estate, uh, yeah, but in knowledge. And when I see a, a person who I consider to be a genius, if you would, in a certain sphere of understanding and knowledge that I am interested in, I'm greedy of that person. I'm jealous of him. I want to be just like that one person. So there is a sense of good greed as well as bad greed. And we have to separate the, the, the both. Uh, from the Bible or whatever testament you want to use, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, the Torah, fine. Uh, the, uh, 
ten spoken words, you know. Last one, you know. Don't be envious. Envy of your man's wife, cattle, sheep, land, etc., etc., etc. You know. Okay. Okay. Uh, ends up in a philosophic idea. Who is the rich person? The rich person is one who's satisfied with his own lot. And the question is, can you find a person satisfied with his own lot? He always wants to go forward. I'm using the he form, please, ladies, excuse me. Uh, they want to go forward. They, they, they want to have this. Uh, you know, I think you made the point, uh, or at least I got the point, that in keeping up with the Joneses, it's there. How it got there, I don't know. It's part of what we have, what we see, what we do, how we feel. And we never take the religious context, context into consideration about being envious. It's more than just envy. It, it carries to the nth degree. Greed, by the way, and you might be interested, is, one of the, is considered one of the seven sins in Catholicism. That's it. I mean, that's where I'm going to stop, but I'll continue. Go ahead. Well, uh, one of the reasons I wanted you to talk a little more about it, Jay, is that I think you sort of do know where it came from. Yes. <laughs> um, so could you talk a little bit about that, um, you know, the, the, this idea of our heritage and all that? Yeah, the genes that we have, or you know, to be more precise, you know, we'll have genes for behaviors and then there are alternative versions that you can have, different alleles. Uh, it's a relative game. In other words, the, the genes that increase in frequency in the population aren't necessarily the ones that are the best or are good enough. They are the ones that are better than the alternatives, uh, which is to say you don't have genes that say, I need to reproduce seven or two or five or whatever the number is. Our genes have built us so that we need to reproduce more. And so they build us in such a way that that outcome is, is very likelihood. And they don't always use the obvious thing. Like, I don't walk around thinking, you know, must maximize reproductive success, must maximize reproductive success. Uh, but instead, I walk around, and if I've had sex before, I think, hmm, that was nice. I think I might want to do it again. <laughs> and if that has the outcome that because it's good, uh, you maximize your reproductive success, as opposed to, let's say, you got an electric shock every time you did. Uh, whatever, whatever caused that negative association, you're not going to do it. So you have this relative thing that's going on, and the alleles, the genes that we carry, are the ones that urge us on to be better. So the statement, don't, you know, you have to keep up with the Joneses, from a genetic perspective, it's not right. You keep up with the Joneses, you're losing. You're, you're right at the same level. And, and you have to, I, I think the line I even wrote was, you know, don't keep up with the Joneses, bury them. Uh, which was terrible because my book got translated. Uh, and in, in Japan, it said, uh, don't keep up with the Tanakas, run them over. <laughs> And, it, and it, it was even worse in Sweden. It was, don't keep up with the Swensons. Kill them. And, but, the, but the point was that it was a relative game. And so what happens with, with the, the So they're not that far off. Even. They're, they're not. I, yeah, I, I hate to, to think about that. But it's the greed issue comes in in that it's not about when I get this, then I'll be happy. We're built to think that. If I could just have this, then I think once and for all, I, I'd be happy. And we're built to always go after that. So it's like you're on a treadmill it's, you know, or, or at the dog races where the little rabbit, they're chasing it around. And that's how we're built so that uh, we're always pushing forward. But if we get the thing, uh, we're not as happy. So it, it leads to that <laughs> paradox where acquiring money makes you feel really good. Having money doesn't make you any happier than if you, if you uh, had less, or it, it's a relatively small increase. But from the genetic perspective, that makes sense. They want me to be doing better, regardless of, of the absolute level that I'm at. But also, the, the consequence of it that, that you said in the little thing you, you sent to me was that you know, we are all the product of ancestors that reproduced more, because those are the ones who survived when disaster struck. The, you know, the people who modestly had small families and didn't aspire to an empire or whatever often were more often those who disappeared, whereas the ones who yes. survived are the ones who had kids, who had us, or who had, whose 
you know, had our great, great, great grandparents. Yeah, if, if you imagine that there is the reasonable strategy, which is, you know, have a good number of kids, acquire a modest amount of stuff, and then stop, and then some gene arises for whatever reason that says, get more, have more, uh, they are passing that on to more kids, and they are more successful. And if times are good, everybody may, may persist. When times get bad, in our evolutionary history, the individuals that were driven to acquire more, uh, that usually was in the form of food, because you couldn't store food for a long time, and so you were more likely to survive. So when I think about who are my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-great-great-grandparents, are they the reasonable people who held off? Uh, no, because those people died out when uh, times got really tough. So my ancestors, your ancestors, your ancestors, everyone's are the ones that are driven for more. So we all inherit that legacy, which doesn't tell you what to do with it, but it says that there's not going to be a lot of variance when it comes to that. We're, we're all going to have it. By virtue of having survived, we are almost yes. inevitably greedy to yes. some degree. Okay. Yes. In systems theory, isn't there something also where a non-dynamic system is one in which it loses it, which is it's moving towards the, its, its own extinction? I think it's when you lose dynamics. That's a good, that's probably a related phenomenon. You had something you wanted to say. We take genes for granted. They're there. And the question has to be posed, and where do they come from? They're antecedents. And that's what the theologian is going to ask you, right or wrong. It's there, you know, a moment. Uh, um, is the gene the breath of life? Is it there, given by whatever it is? for you to be able to uh, continue uh, in your existence. Uh, putting it, and I'm, I'm not a physician and I'm not a psychiatrist or an attorney. Uh, is it something like this, that the breath of life that was given to you was a sense of metabolism? And that metabolism creates whatever is gonna be created? And that creation will go on and on and on. We come down to the gene we have discovered, at the gene. It's been there all the time, but we had to discover it. And that's the wisdom that we have, that has been endowed to us in what we do, how we say, in the manner in which we do it. Now, you recall that I said inside that the, uh, I asked about the seed of all human existence, and I, it was not a jest, but it's, a create, it, it, it's not a, even a creative thought. To have a good heart, if you have a good heart, you're gonna have greed, you know. But the heart is only a pump that can be replaced in any shape, manner, or form. Thank you, Dr. DeBakey. We're gonna have transplants all over the world, and they go on every day. But the seed of all human existence is the human brain that gives us the possibility to be able to function on a day-to-day -day basis, and to think on a day-to-day -day basis. It has two parts to it. <clears throat> now, we can only do one thing to the brain, and that we can shut off a part of it that creates Parkinson's. But as I told you, when the trauma is over, all the symptoms return. But you still have the capacity to think. And that's probably one of the greatest capacities that the human being has. You think of good, you think of bad. Is there a possibility in between? As I told you, I'm a greedy person. Doesn't make me a bad person. But I'm greedy for something that's quite different. Not money, not land, not taking it out of my neighbor, not being part of the Joneses, but for increasing my personal knowledge to understand, understand myself, the people I teach, and the community that I live in. I'm leaving the world aside because it's in a lot of trouble today. Okay. Can I pose yeah. a question around genes? Because I was very interested in that discussion, and that is, I, I'm gathering you wouldn't take the two positions on this. One is that there's something highly deterministic about genes, position number two. Uh, one, and number two is that because genes have a deterministic element to the ergo, uh, they have the moral upside because that in fact becomes the bottom line of, of, of analysis. When in fact we know that, or at least there seems to be increasing evidence that there are other mechanisms of transmission from one generation to the next, i.e., we know something about epigenetics, yep. that in fact certain things can occur that will not demethylate and change the 
structure. I mean, I think a lot of that was done in botany with toad flax flowers, and but still, there may be some evidence of that in human beings. And, explain that a little more. Uh, uh, genetics, uh, epigenetics, is that a process that occurs outside of DNA, outside of the gene, that brings about changes that may go for a couple of generations. Uh, there's some kind of process of demethylation that, I mean, I think one example is beta methazone. If you give beta methazone to guinea pigs, they will become hyperactive. And then, interestingly enough, it, it may go on for three generations. It's not DNA that's different. It's that something has happened in the construct of the DNA or the gene through uh, epigenetics. Ergo, some other process is occurring. And then, of course, that wonderful book by that Israeli uh, scientist on four me mechanisms of, of transmission, where she talks about culture as a very important part of transmission. Ergo, you can see where culture can, at any point in history, influence and alter the brain of people, even if the gene is the so-called selfish gene. And then secondly is the notion, notion of language as having some kind of alterative effect on the genetic process. So all I'm posing is, I'm just trying to open this up a little bit and saying that I, I wouldn't totally agree with I certainly like your proposition because I think there's a lot of merit in that, but I don't totally agree with the fact that there's something set and concrete about this or that it is deterministic or that there aren't other factors that can alter what is happening to humans at any point in history if you were thinking of an evolutionary fact. It's, uh, we'll you'll have to wait to... A little later. I, I think it's, it's so dangerous any time you want to talk about behavior and it being influenced by, by genes. It's really crazy, even in this day and age, that it is immediately equated with this viewpoint, as you say, deterministic. Oh, if you're saying that there are genes that influence a behavior, then uh, A, you can't help it, B, you're not responsible, C, nothing can be done about it, and so on. It, it leads people to, to immediately you know, start using, you know, spinning scenarios that, that are, are ridiculous and, and not true. There, as an example, uh, animals have taste preferences for foods. They prefer fatty foods with a little bit of sugar in them. And if you do little experiments, they will reliably show this preference in across all sorts of species. But what you can do is you can alter them. So what I'll do is I have animals in these outside pens, and I know they really like the fatty protein food, but I can take another one where they can get all the, the calories of the night without having to go far from their burrow. And so it's much safer, and they don't want to do this. If I put a really big pile, they get there, and they kind of look, and they're like, all right, and they sit there, and they eat, they eat the millet, which they don't want to. And I would still say there has been the evolution of a genetic taste preference in these animals, but it's modifiable. Now when we get to humans, what you were saying, that we have this two parts of our brain, I really like that, and it's one of the only times I will tell my students uh, that yes, humans are special because I don't believe we're super special from an evolutionary perspective, except that we have this part of our brain that has allowed us to be really, really good, not great, but really good at overriding certain genetic urges that we have. And so uh, many of those uh, are with respect to, to food. If we think about the taste preferences, I have my taste preferences as well. I think about Krispy Kreme donuts and In-N-Out Burger all the time. It's all I want to do is eat them. And I'm overriding that constantly. And your uh, Lipitor is very good, I hope. That's all I got to say. <laughs> but it's something that the whole world deals with. As, as the GDP goes up, so does the average body weight. People have more and more access to food, and they get worse at fighting it. When it comes to things like greed, I'm saying that we are all the products of evolution from those greedy ancestors. And yet, at the same time, we have this little thing in our brain that says, I can go down that road, I think of it as the pet path. Your pet does whatever it wants to do. Or I can go down a different path that sometimes will be more difficult, but for whatever reason, cultural reasons. People, you know, society has decided, hey, we think we're all better off doing this. Like what you were saying, a regulation of something that's in, in the long run better for everyone. And my brain allows me to do that. So that's the view of genes and behavior that I have. The subtitle of the book I wrote, Mean Genes, was 
taming our primal instincts. So it is about exactly that, that you can modify so them. How do so you cut that animals? Animals uh, have less greedy instincts than males than, than, than humans. Yep. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, well, they're, more if, they're more aggressive. If, if you give animals at all access to more food, for instance, they, they will consume it and consume it and consume it, and they immediately convert it into offspring. There are great studies where biologists just dump barrels of food in certain places, and they alter the animal's behavior tremendously, that they give up everything so that they can eat more, and their reproductive rates go through the roof. So it's this really nice... Uh, conversion that we don't quite see with human greed, the direct relationship to reproduction, but we see that the desire to have, have more and, and convert more into some evolutionarily meaningful outcome is there. But just to, I want to get to you, but just to summarize sort of what you're saying in, in common parlance, it sounds like you're saying we have this survival ge genetic drive. But there's a social harmony, sort of moral, instinctual thing that sort of overlays it that can sometimes work across purposes. And that does go to the regulatory question and when do we allow one to prevail, right? Yeah, I, I, I was hoping that the nicer side of human nature would come out in this. I, it, it is true that if you didn't have enough stuff relative to others, if your ancestors didn't, you wouldn't be here. Uh, can I think. Say there's one dimension of that that you didn't touch on that, that's probably even more important than the food, which is the idea that most vertebrate species and certainly early human societies were polygynous, meaning that males take more than one mate if they can. It's important to stress the if they can part because if some do, that means others won't get any. And so in the Darwinian scheme, that's really the, the biggest payoff of all is do you get your stuff into the next generation? And so who gets more than one mate. Uh, it was in every context I've ever read any accounting of, it was the high-ranking males who had multiple mates, the low-ranking males had none. So if you think, do I care about my rank? Uh, if the answer is yes, uh, and I'm therefore willing to expend more effort to acquire and maintain it, then I'm more likely to, to have a mate and, and more likely than to leave my stuff behind. So that's undeniably a central component of it, but uh, here are a couple of thought experiments that I think uh, tease out the other side. Uh, so so uh, first imagine there's a drug that a sprinter could take that no one could possibly detect and it would make you three tenths of a second faster in the hundred meters. So here's the question. <clears throat> Do you know anyone who would refuse to take that drug? Somebody who cared about winning in the competition, many, oh, of course. Would that person ever win a gold medal? Answer, no. Uh, the, the, what we know is that some people would take the drug. It can't be detected. It, it improves performance enough that three-tenths is enough to uh, guarantee that a person who didn't take it wouldn't have a winning time. So that's kind of the stick figure Darwinian account of how if, if, if you have a chance to cheat and you don't take advantage of it, uh, you'll go extinct, and so everybody's a cheater. Fine, but what about this? Uh, you've lost an envelope uh, with $10,000 in it, at a concert, a crowded concert, you get home, you see it's not in your coat pocket where you thought it was. Uh, it had your name and address on the envelope. Do you know anyone who you feel sure would return your envelope to you if he or she found it? Uh, and then most people will think about that and say, well, yeah, I, I, know, I know. And they'll usually name someone they've known well for a long time, somebody who they think just wouldn't feel right about not returning it if she found it. Well, okay, uh, will that person ever succeed in the world? Uh, the answer is very different from the question, will that person, uh, the answer I think maybe would rush say, well, no, she'll be buried, she's a chump, she'll, she'll, she'll get left on the evolutionary scrap heap, but when an executive has an important division to open and it's, it's, a, it's a job where you could uh, self-deal to a certain extent without anyone finding out, he doesn't want to send just anyone out to be that manager. Uh, he wants somebody who would be trustworthy in that situation when there's really no way uh, with cameras on the wall or, or incentive contracts to, to enforce that. And so you pick the person that you think would return your envelope full of cash if she found it. Uh, and then the question is, can we identify such people? And this comes back again to Adam Smith's uh, account of the moral sentiments. Uh, we've done experiments, we've uh, in the lab shown that if you put people with strangers, they're going to play a game. Can you predict who will cheat you? 
not perfectly, but with remarkable accuracy after only talking for 15 or 30 minutes with the other person. So that's, that's the force pushing in the opposite direction. Everybody wants nice people. Nobody wants to hang around with opportunists. If you have a loyal cadre of associates, you can achieve more than if you're on your own as a mean, selfish person. And so how do you get a loyal cadre? Uh, if you're a mean, selfish person, no one's going to want you on their team, basically. You've got, to, you've got to have those competing impulses in the front, too. So I think to, to account for what, what humans do without, without shining a bright light on that, we're not going to really get the, the nuanced picture that we are. Did you have something? You know, you know what you reminded me of is the story of the cab driver who found the Stradivarius in his back seat. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, he could have done one or two things. He gave it back. But he had a, a whole world open to him. I have something that has a tremendous amount of value. Uh, it will either be good for me or give it back to the other person. Now, he could have done many things with that and probably be detected in the end, right. maybe. There's always a maybe to that. Sure. Or gotten away with it. But he chose the right way to do it, right. or what we call the right way. And he returned the Stradivarius to the person, and everyone was happy. Newspaper stories were fine. Oh, okay, he's a saint, you know. Or is he just a good human being? We give titles to sainthood up, all the way up and down the line, and we shouldn't do it. I think, I think you've got to give credit to people for doing the right thing in situations right. like that. I, I, I have psychologist friends who want to argue that Mother Teresa deserved no credit because she took pleasure in helping the poor, that she was really a selfish person in that sense. But that seems to misunderstand the common meaning of selfish. You know, if you, if you take pleasure in helping other people, well, yeah, that may be why you do it, but that's still good. Yeah, but, but Mother Teresa said it herself. She had her conflict with faith, and she wrote about it. It was on a day-to-day -day basis, and she always asked the same question, which is a, a, a blank in, in, in the book, in, or what she says, or, or what is written about her. But she did good for the sake of good. Now, did she have a good gene? That's the question. <laughs> was the good gene overriding the bad gene? I mean, no, I, I think of the, these issues of what I, I'll call reciprocal altruism very, from very much a genetic perspective. Now, think about this in your life. You know, when you go out with friends for dinner, uh, is there someone who you know more often than not doesn't pay their share of the bill? Someone who's, who's you know, always just a little slow to actually calculate the tip and the tax and all that. And uh, how many of you are this person? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is that we have these instincts to do what uh, I would call a, a parent altruism, <laughs> what you're saying, where, where it is. Society would say, hey, this, this is good. But genetics and evolution uh, can be driving that because, as you said, we as a society or we as a group of people, even the selfish ones, can do better if we work together in some situations than if we don't. But you're really, really vulnerable as an individual any time you want to get into that sort of situation. I'm going to do something kind because I can get taken advantage of. And so throughout the animal kingdom, there are tens of millions of species on Earth. And with one or two exceptions, we don't see any of this apparent altruism where it looks kind between unrelated individuals. And so why is it that humans are so good at it? And one of the things is that we live for a long time. We've now evolved so we can recognize lots of different individuals so that we can keep track of the cheaters and punish them by not continuing to be kind to them. And through those, by having repeated interactions with lots of people, now we can get the benefit. Like, ah, I always know this guy helps me out. This person's good. And so you can get those, those synergies without as much risk. And so in the case of Mother Teresa, uh, or people like that, if you are built, if your brain has evolved so that you get the pleasure from doing the thing for the other people, from an evolutionary perspective, to the extent that that causes people to owe you and pay you back, that's the right thing. That's what's favored. But ha having a brain that's built that way sets the stage for people who they get that payoff 
without the outcome of now that person's going to pay me back. But they're just like, hey, every time I do these good things, I get something in my brain. You can probably tell me what it is. Somewhere in the you know dopamine release system, I get my pleasure center tickled. And so I am getting the payoff without the genetic evolutionary payoff. And so I think that's why you can have people saying, I do all this good stuff, but I actually, you know, I am getting rewarded. I am getting paid off because from their brain's perspective, they are. That's a purely behavioral type of approach, though. I mean, you, you know, what you're proposing is a more complicated view of genetics than, than of human, than, than of human, you, you propose con conscience rather than consciousness. I mean, we, animals don't corner the market in grain. You know, I mean, I mean, they, we don't, they, they, we, they, have, they don't have wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 you're proposing a totally beneficent picture of, of, uh, of, the, of the human, you know, of human responsibility here. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a much less benevolent picture than I think you can justify. I mean, it, it, it says that you'll leave a tip in a restaurant you expect to visit again because, you know, after all, the waiter will take note if you don't and won't give you good service next time. But when people are on the road eating in a restaurant, they know they'll never visit again. Uh, that calculation would dictate, well, I'll, I can either pay 100 or 120, which is better. Uh, clearly, 100 uh, is better for me. So what if the waiter's unhappy? What can he do? Uh, but if you sort of outline that economic reasoning to people, most people don't say that, oh, from now on, I'm not going to leave tips when I'm on the road. That doesn't seem to be why. They, they, they seem to feel that the waiter gave good service, and it's my duty now to, to respond by leaving the expected tip. Uh, I could respond to that, but I will <laughs> Yes, I, and that, that kind of maladaptive behavior, I'll call it, absolutely exists and has been produced by natural selection because of this weird situation. We evolved as hunter-gatherers. So 99% of our evolutionary history was characterized by not very much food. It was unpredictable food. And we were in a group that was from 100 to 300 people. So if you have evolved in the context where every person that you see and interact with, you are in an ongoing relationship, and your brain evolves to have the reward systems in place, we're in a novel, uh, or I'd, what I'd call an alien environment now, where you get to have dinner with a waiter who you will never, ever see again. You get to ride in a cab with someone you will never see. And so our brains are tricked. The evolutionary brain is doing the right thing. And it takes consciousness to say, wow, I should be giving this guy less. Uh, and that's not how we work. Most of us don't, don't work like that. Larry, but isn't, isn't it, I, I thought there's been some increasing evidence that there is a biological basis to notions of fairness. And if I'm not, there was this in, interesting experiment that was done down in Atlanta. It might have been Franz Duvall's group, yes. where they took these capuchin monkeys and they had 12 of them and they were the, the female ones acted differently than the males and they they taught them a token economy and they could purchase a piece of cucumber and uh, if if in fact one of the monkeys was given a grape which is at a higher value the other monkeys got very angry and if the grape was given and there was no token transmitted, the monkeys got furious and kicked the tokens and kicked the cucumbers. And so there was some kind of notion. There's a kind of biological base. Now, I'm not, willing, I'm not a geneticist, so I'm not willing to say this is genetic. But it would seem to me that it has a kind of competing element to this greed gene. Um, but I'd be interested in your yeah, I, I would say not competing at all. I think that a sense of justice is the, the natural extension from you make yourself vulnerable when you, you do this act of kindness for someone else in a system where you're hoping to, that reciprocity will cause it in the long run, your action benefits you. If you have a sense of justice, what that is, that is your way of saying, someone else has done something wrong. I must not be a trading partner with them. Someone else has done something wrong to someone I know. I must not be a trading partner with them. I do this game in my, my class with students uh, called the ultimatum game. So you know this, the, it's a negotiating, we have a pie to split, $40. And I say, okay, you're gonna propose a split, $35 for you and $5 for the other guy, or 15 for you and 25 for the other guy. And the other guy has one job, and he says either yes or no. I take the money you're offering or no. And a lot of people, uh, economists primarily, I think, would have said, well, everyone's going to accept everything they can all the time. You have to add that they each get nothing if you refuse. They each get, if you refuse it, you get nothing. So why would you, why would you smash the pie and not, not have anyone get anything? But when you do these experiments, some why? significant minority 
A, make generous responses. So they offer more to the other person, which wouldn't make sense uh, except from an evolutionary perspective. And B, some people smash the pie up. So in my class, I ask people at the end, they've written it down, who said that they would turn down the stingy offer? And about 25% of them raised their hands. And I, I asked uh, someone once, I just pointed to some guy, I said, well, why would you turn down? This is a free lunch. You can walk to the student union, and I'm giving away real money in, in class. And he's got veins bulging out of his forehead. He's like, because it's a freaking disgrace. And I'm like, wow. Uh, but he echoed what a lot of people thought, that there are right and wrong things to do, and we're willing to even pay money to enforce them. But I, I view that as part of a system that allows us to make ourselves vulnerable so that we, we can benefit from reciprocities and, and coalitions and, and friendships. I mean, I call it friendship in quotes because you know, people think that this view is a little cynical, but, uh, but it kind of works. Uh, can I say? Yeah, you got a mic for that. Uh, you said that you said that you were debating whether you would say call the chapter greed or happiness, and then in talking about it, you said that uh, let's just focus on the money aspects of greed. That that didn't bring happiness in and of itself. That it wasn't that you had money that you were happy, but that you had to get more money to go after happiness. Uh, what my experience is uh, treating patients who have money and who uh, maybe would be categorized in the group of those who keep going after more is that that's not what's motivating them. What's motivating them most of the time is fear of not having it or having less. It's a lot of anxiety that pushes them rather than the feeling that every time I make another uh, half a million dollars or a million dollars or even greater numbers, I am ecstatic. In fact, that goes most of the time without much reaction. But they lose $100,000 and they are scared. So how does that fit into your... Yeah, I, I think that's ab absolutely true, that people's motivations can differ in a lot of different ways. And sometimes they're not even for the money at all, win winning it or losing sure, it. it. But as you were saying, acquiring mates, that if you have high status uh, with a lot of these species, it's not, it's always phrased as, oh, you know, the top male gets all the mates. I always view it the other way, that the top male is selected by a lot more females because he has something that she values uh, and she's greedy too. And in the case of of this not wanting to lose it or wanting to gain it or wanting to gain it so that you have something else. I don't know. Uh, same but is if, true with but women. If the, out, if the outcome go. is the same, then from, from, I, I'm always so much more interested in the evolutionary perspective. If the behavior occurs and this is the outcome, I'm satisfied. And so I think you do get lots of different mechanisms or stories that people tell themselves. But you know, the, the genes are sitting there thinking, I don't care. You know, tell yourself whatever you want. Just you know, get, get more money, get higher status. By, by way of asking the question to the rabbi, I mean, I would just throw in, haven't most or all of us had the experience that we you know, in a sort of karmic way, we've at least sometimes in our lives found that we were just doing a lot of really nice things and it just seemed like more nice things were happening to us as a consequence. And, and certainly there's plenty of spiritual practices and other behavioral techniques that trade on this notion that if you do that, it really works. And, and I mean, it's a, maybe it's a spiritual concept or maybe not. It's a spiritual concept with the phrase, a good deed will always generate another good deed, a bad deed will always generate another bad deed. Whether it's psychology, psychiatry, genes, I don't know. That's the statement that's made by the ancients. They put it into practice and it seemed to work. No all, no all, no 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 goes up, right you are. <laughs> <laughs> always, always is a strong word there, too. I, I mean, with, with regard to the animals, uh, and the consciousness or unconsciousness, uh, if I'm incorrect, please correct me. During the Katrina tsunami, uh, there was a tsunami, the first one was tsunami, am I correct? Uh, yeah. Tsunami. Yeah. Uh, we human beings did not detect the catastrophe that was going to occur, but the animals did and they ran for the hills. And many of them were saved. I mean, this is a, this is not apocryphal literature. This is a historic fact. The question is, why? Do they have something that we don't possess? Do we have something that they don't possess? 
they manage to talk to each other, at least I think they talk to each other, relate to each other, have a sense of uh, propriety for one another, uh, know when to have uh, relations with one another, but they can't speak the language that we speak, but yet they understand us, and we can teach them. That, that, that's a phenomenon. Is that a gene? Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 so, I'm so fascinated by this. There's a, there's a biblical passage, and I don't like to bring the Bible in all the time, but it, 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 it relates to exactly what you're saying. A mother and father have a child. The child is rambunctious. They give it a very, very title. They bring him to the court. Child does not listen to us. He is zoleil v'soveya. He's a glutton, and he's never satisfied. <laughs> oh, come on. Number one, do you think parents would bring a child like that to the court? I mean, this is not we're talking about an angel, you know, with uh, uh, with cocaine and things like that, where they want to get, you know. Okay. There's the example. Is there good? inherent in what the parents are trying to do for the child and that is the nth degree that they have available to them. Everything else has failed. Psychiatry hasn't worked. They have everything that they have. They, money is not the question. He's just, <laughs> he's a glutton. What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I speak to? Is there an answer? You gave me the answer. Uh, believe it or not, you gave me the answer. It is there. And maybe they detected it a long time ago, but they couldn't put it into the practice of the way you so beautifully stated, you know, in, in the manner in which you stated it. No doubt about it. I have a question for you, sir, on Adam Smith. Does Gresham's theory of economics fall into the whole system that we have right now with regard to Adam Smith and Gresham, you know, top, bottom, spy, demand, and things like that. Uh, Gresham's law says uh, bad money drives out good money. So if you had different kinds of coins, and some of them were inherently worth more than others, people would hoard the good ones and spend the bad ones. Uh -huh. uh, and I think we do see the analog of that now. People are, are holding on to the secure assets and trying to dump the ones that aren't so secure. That's and they think. Standard practice. Standard practice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Larry, I wanted to ask you for a clinical view. You know, I mean, this is a, sort of a bald question, but you know, do you are, are people happier with more? Is that just a given that the answer is no or not? Uh, well, I don't know that of any studies. I think many years ago, actually, there was one of those Golden Fleece Awards that Mr. Prockmeyer gave <laughs> to the National Institutes of Mental Health that did a study back in the 70s where they tried to find out what made people happy. And they did. They paid. They cost a couple hundred thousand dollars, and they went down to Florida, and they discovered that being well, you're happier than if you're sick, and you're happier if you have, if you're wealthy versus if you're poor, and all of the cliches that you would expect with happiness. I think the interesting. I mean, I, I'm fascinated with this discussion. First of all, I, I, I'm, thus far it seems to be that we've looked at kind of so-called normal people who have this genetic. Uh, thrust in the direction of greed and maybe also some elements of fairness and justice and parts of the brain and I mean the more I think another interesting question is to look at the pathological dimensions of this which are uh, to what extent is greed a biological mistake when it becomes excessive to what extent could one argue that it that it uh, that it complies with addictive behaviors, and there seems to be some evidence or increasing evidence in that direction. I mean, there was a study done in your institution on linking sex with greed for money and finding that when they, I think they took 15 young men, probably a mistake, heterosexual men, and they introduced them to uh, to uh, some kind of erotic situations and discussed it. They took more risks and they were more into greed. And, and there, so there must have been some kind of linkage in the brain between these two. And then, of course, the question is, well, if we look at 
the so-called pleasure parts of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, which is the pleasure part that's often associated with addiction, drug addictions, that there may be something analogous between what happens with people who go excessively into greed and the addictive personality, the addictive behavior. That you know, it, it could be argued that maybe the D2 receptor sites in the nucleus accumbens and the limbic system of the brain are less in these people and so that they're not going to be stimulated enough by natural reinforcers that you and I might be stimulated by reading and things of that nature, but they need something greater and greed is the thing that kind of stimulates them. So I guess the question is that is it the case that what we're experiencing now amongst people that have seemed to have gone to extremes in the accumulating of mo money part of the natural phenomenon of the genetic process? Or could one argue that there may be something that's pathologically occurring in certain groups of these people? Well, I would add to that, not just pathologically, but I think uh, the, the issues with which they were growing up that led to the kind of personality that they have and the character that they have contributes to this. So, that's why I'm a little bit puzzled about such an idea even as a great gene because I can see that there are, within evolution, there is a need to maximize uh, the continuation of one's species. But I don't see why that should be considered in any way as greed uh, because it may be that greed is really not part of our genetic or uh, brain systems at all but it's a creation of uh, our morality and our mind. And in fact, what happens is that people who have a lot of insecurity for whatever reason in their childhood, death of a parent, bankruptcy of a parent, uh, unav unavailability of parents, develop the need later in life to accumulate, to gather things around them that they wouldn't otherwise. So I'm wondering where you would stand in, in making that distinction between what, let's say, would be a more psychological, psychoanalytic way of looking at it and a more uh, evolutionary way of looking at it. Yeah, I, I, and it connects to what I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think, was I think it connects very much because there are situations. So, so I, I think an interesting and well-studied one has to do with this receptor. There's a D4, or D2 dopamine receptor in the pleasure parts of your brain. It's a situation where there's actually some variation. So it's not just, oh, we all are this way. Some people have uh, certain versions of the gene that codes for a receptor that doesn't give them as much pleasure from normal things, acquiring food, a mate, status, right. that others get. And there's a lot of good data showing that these individuals will seek out other ways that lead to, to the rewards in the brain, uh, primarily novelty seeking, but other addictive behaviors in terms of being more likely to, to have tried drugs uh, or be addicted to them, to have tried just novel things. Individuals that have one of these particular genes are five, five times more likely to have had a same-sex encounter, a sexual experience with someone of the same sex. And it was a beautiful study because a lot of people might say, oh, well, maybe those people just were gay and there were reasons why they couldn't. Uh, people who had already identified themselves as gay were five times as le more likely to have had uh, an experience with someone of the opposite sex. So again, they're seeking out the, yeah. the novelty uh, in these situations. So there are genes that create variation within us. and as you point out, that, that your experiences early on in life can be really shaping in many different ways. I think about this all the time, you know, as someone raising three kids. What are the things that I'm doing when I see these various acquisitive desires and, and little mini versions of greed? And there are things that I can do. I'm sort of looking at from the reverse perspective of you, things that I do that actually cause them to be better able to rein it in as opposed to the opposite. So you can have these 
predilections, these predispositions, and your experiences can teach you uh, lessons about about the value that hey, this is actually good when I, I you know rein this in in a bit. And so I, I think it's it's huge. And I mean, I, I my entire career because I am a teacher is a testament to the fact that I believe people have some genetic background that can be modified. If it couldn't be modified, I wouldn't have the job I'd have because. So you really then, despite what you said before, don't really believe that there is intrinsically a genetic predilection for greed. There is a, an intrinsic predilection. I absolutely believe there is. I don't believe that everyone is doomed to fail uh, in terms of managing what the outcome that that gene brings them. Yeah, because the way Ed forecast it is really a diametrically contradictory point of view that it's based on you know learned experience. Yes, right? and yes, and 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 I wouldn't agree with that, but I, I agree that you learn better or worse strategies for for coping with it, and and so they never go away. I am never without my greed or my my hunger or these things that are there. And for me, that was one of the most useful things in my life was to to learn something that a lot of people would view as depressing. Oh, you're, you've got a genetic predisposition to this, this, and this. But for me, it was empowering because once I knew that it was there and it was always going to be there, but I also had the option of of winning. I, you know, I have self-discipline. I can say yes or no, and I can gain my strength from from knowing that it's there, uh, E.O. Wilson wrote, you know, that the, the twig is bent from the start. And for me, once I knew that, I, I thought, I walk around feeling good on most days because in the face of this enemy, I view it as an enemy, I win uh, all the time. And, and so rather than just winning but not knowing that there was an enemy there, it kind of makes me feel good. There, there's something about the, the control. You're right. You mean the human being is worth enemy? Each human being. Say that again. Each human being is eventually their their own worst enemy. Yes. We. Uh, Can I just ask one question about the, the, taking your point though, and your, bring you maybe to, to answer it. Are these derivatives that have hit the that have come about in the stock market? Are they like the the, the in the in the noble instance you give? Are they like the crack for the person with the susceptibility? I mean, are they so stimulating that they alter this responsibility function that we've been talking about, the consciousness function? Um, well, I, I think that's a uh, that's a valid question. I mean, that's sort of what I was implying when I asked whether or not there was a pathological dimension to what we've been experiencing. Uh, I'm thinking less psychoanalytically and more biologically no. in terms of brain processing and, and, and the addictive process. And uh, certainly, uh, it would seem to me, if you look at, 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 I mean, work has been done on on people that are are uh, obsessive gamblers, and it's been shown what that the reward part of the brain is altered and the dopamine structures in the D2 levels are changed. I mean, why would that not also be arguably the case in people who are really into greed and acquisition and losing any kinds of perspectives of what they're, it's all, of what they're doing? It's also interesting to note that 12-step programs, which have been demonstrated to be effective in many of these kinds of pathologies, are based on two fundamental principles, a faith that things will be better and helping others. That, and that's constantly re reiterated in the course of those, the practice of those programs. So it, it goes to what you were saying. And certainly, I mean, from a psychiatric standpoint, we, we believe in neuroplasticity, as Dr. Phelan was suggesting there. I mean, there is evidence, uh, a lot of evidence, that the brain can be altered to some extent. I mean, the real question is that all of us are probably born with a certain real stat and at a certain level, ethics may not be as dominating a factor in our decisions as biological dimensions. And the question is, where is that? Where does that rheostat stop in the individual? And if we look at people who have serious addictions, such as cra greed and cravings of that nature, I, I mean, whether or not neuroplasticity could make a difference or not, it's, it may be questionable. The genes may be so powerful in terms of the biology that it may be very difficult to do that. Um, I don't think yeah. you need to, to really reach to explain the creation of these derivatives. They, they were legal. Uh, Phil Graham inserted a provision into a bill in December of 2000 exempting this new kind of paper from any oversight by Congress or the regulatory agencies. And so if you were smart and could think one up and sell it to somebody, you could make money. And you're not, you're not uh, an anomaly if you take pleasure in making money. There, there's a, a big... 
a big literature on happiness. It's true that uh, once you move up a notch, you tend to sort of develop a new reference group and, and, and reach a little higher than, than you had before. But the happiness literature is now an old literature. And it's the consistent finding is, is it that on average, people with more money are happier than people with less money. There are plenty of people with very little money who are very happy. Plenty of rich people who aren't happy at all. But on average, there's a big difference uh, between the happiness levels. And now, as more data accumulate, it, it, it used to be thought that when everybody got more money over time, nobody got any happier, uh, the, the, the idea people inferred from that apparent finding was that it was only your relative income that mattered. But now as more survey data have accumulated over the decades, uh, researchers are even now seeing that when people get richer in tandem, they get a little happier. And Isn't there a quantitative? But not much. No, I mean, some of these vehicles, like you have 60 to $80 trillion in credit swaps. These figures are astronomical. And there was a class of people being born in this past, say, uh, 20 years that were richer comparatively than any of the aristocracy that in America had ever experienced. Oh, you, you, could say, you could say truly, what would anyone need that amount of money for? Well, but I think yeah, what you have to appreciate is that people travel in very local circles. I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer years ago in Nepal. I, I lived in a two-room house with no electricity or plumbing. It, it was totally satisfactory. You wouldn't want anybody to see where you lived if you lived in a house like that here. But by the same token, if, if my friends from there came and saw my house in Ithaca, New York, you wouldn't think it was strange, but they would think I'd completely taken leave of my sense of what would, would anyone need such a house, they would wonder. We want to get to the audience, uh, but go ahead. Uh, what you've just now said about Nepal, uh, you know Jim Simons. I'm sure you do. Uh, sure. He has a... Uh, what shall I say, a uh, foundation to help in hospitals and things like that in Nepal. And uh, he said exactly what you said. I mean, in terms of living conditions, these people would think they are living in heaven if they ever came to your house. I want to have one question and I'm finished. Can we ever regulate greed? And if we can, what example could we use? Who are you asking? But I, I didn't hear the whole question. Can, can we ever can regulate we, greed? Can we ever regulate? Can we regulate greed? That's the question. Well, that's related. I want to just. I, where, what source would we want to use for it? I mean, haven't we actually regulated greed in a thousand ways from time immemorial? Though, I mean, the question is, and I wanted to focus this to Bob briefly, and then I want to hear what people in the audience think, and and anybody who wants to comment on the rabbi's question too, but. You know, we are in this, uh, this unique situation right now where the behavior of a very small number of people, relatively speaking, has, you know, you could almost say jeopardized the entire planet. Now, many of the circumstances that led to the, to the non-stasis before the, the, these behaviors probably were, we all contributed to to some degree, but nonetheless, there's an identifiable group that did some things that we now realize were very counterproductive. Right, and they are leading even potentially to bankruptcies of entire nations around the world in the next phase, and that's being predicted within weeks potentially. So, what should we do, you know, as an ethicist and as a business scholar as you are, and also as we approach a, a global conference that President Bush has convened to try to figure out what we do? What would you say with this notion of greed at the, as the foundational uh, concept? The, the things that got done were the predictable consequences of not putting those kinds of securities under regulatory oversight. So I think if you want to get angry at somebody, get angry at Phil Graham and others who, who probably had enough information to know that that was risky. Maybe they didn't fully anticipate the, the consequences. The people who did it were not the ones who, were, who we would then call the greedy ones. No, the greedy one in some <laughs> ways was Phil Graham, or somehow he was the facilitator of the greed. But, but the thing is, how, do you, how could it be determined that those were the vehicles by which the greed would be manifest? Or is that coincidental, or could that have been determined in advance? Yeah, I, I don't know the extent to which anyone could have foreseen this. Ned, Ned Gramlich, uh, a former colleague of mine, in, in 2001 warned Alan Greenspan that there would be a meltdown of this sort because of the way pe people were expanding credit uh, with leverage unlike anything he'd ever seen and that the appraisals weren't honest, the ratings on the bonds weren't honest, the, you know, no one had good incentives to, to produce 
the kind of control that would have prevented this from happening, and, and there were warnings about it before it happened. Well, there's a great, a great article in the Times a couple weeks ago about the woman who was the head of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, who basically came right out and was ardently advocating this should be regulated, and Greenspan and whoever was uh, some other, uh, I forget who was Treasury Secretary at the time. So. Uh, I forget who it was, but they, they, he, she was like actively suppressed and Ru ultimately fired. Rubin was unfriendly to the yeah, idea Ru of regulating these right. securities. Yeah. She was really almost, you know, uh, she was she was ridiculed and mm -hmm. and really demonized by an entire class of financial leaders in the country. It, the it's time. a horrible system. Some of the smartest students we turn out become financial engineers. They add no value to society at all. They yeah. dream up instruments yeah. that get one step ahead of the, and of the course, forecasting game and sell them and make a lot of money. But if, if none of them did any of those things, the, the income in the country would be greater by the sum total of what they could produce if they were doing other, other useful things. They're not doing anything useful when they do that. but. Again, who do you get? Well, there are those who, who get angry on that. I think. But, I mean, do, you, do you feel they don't have any ethical responsibility? I mean, I'm, I'm amazed by this. Uh, you seem to be focusing totally on the regulators, and it's like the actors don't. They, they are they, they, they should they have unlimited, untrammeled. Uh, you know, it's, 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 that's, a, that's a very good question. And, you know, when you're making a lot of money by doing something that the law allows, uh, how much do we expect people to pose difficult questions to themselves about, is it okay for me to be doing what I'm doing? Uh, you know, th their success depended on their not asking those questions, maybe in hindsight now. It, it would have been great if someone had asked that question, but then Suppose he said, well, this is going to lead to no good end and shouted a warning out, and then nothing happened. Well, it's easier to imagine the person who was actually the lender who gave a loan to someone who they didn't even ask about their income, who only earned, you know, a well less than would clearly be necessary to buy the house. That person perhaps has more immediate culpability than someone who's trading in some financial house of mirrors, you know, you know, it's derivative right. four levels removed in London for AIG and, you know, making billions. But, you know, it's maybe a little easier to understand that that right. person wouldn't be asking themselves the moral question. But we need to hear from Andy, you had something, anybody who wants, but come to the mic if you have anything to say or question or comment. And identify yourself, please. Hi, Larry Amsel. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, actually, I'm on call this weekend, and I have to see 30 patients and, and write 30 notes. And regardless of that, I found myself coming to two of these um, over this weekend. <laughs> and I, I want to just thank and compliment people who organize these kinds of things. I teach at Columbia University, which is a major academic institution, and yet I think you are fulfilling a role that academia has not fulfilled in a long time, which is to bring the kind of intellectually stimulating conversation um, to bear on, on large issues. And it's not, it's not even happening in the academic world. So thank you guys for that. And it's, uh, like I said, I'm going to have to stay up late tonight to have done this, but it was well worth my while. I'm greedy for that, as you mentioned. <laughs> it seemed to me that one of the things that we, that this is kind of, kind of a discussion, which I, what, I, what I like about it so much is it kind of brings psychoanalysis together with economics, which we rarely see. Uh, done, although the neuroeconomists are now starting to do that. Um, but I think that in, in the question of where the genetic determinism, how we can understand that, I think Freud had an answer. I think he called it sublimation. I think the notion that through symbolic substitution, you know, you can take your drives for food and you can, you can re- transform those through, through symbolic and linguistic transformation, you can get to understand that, um, for example, I substitute my want for food. If I become a very knowledgeable person, I'll have a certain status in the society, and people might feed me. So the sublimation, it seems to me, <laughs> uh, it seems to me. So I wanted to ask the question whether or not. And then the economists have this have this axiom that everything has a substitute, right? So and I wondered whether or not the, the economic notion of everything has a substitute and Freud's notion of sublimation could somehow explain this lack of determinism. <laughs> It is astonishing how many ways you can get to a, a given end. Uh, I think that's one of the central messages we have to offer to students. That I mean, basically, our, our simple principle is that if something yields benefits greater than the cost, you should do it. Otherwise, you shouldn't do it. But uh, the the goal you're trying to serve. Uh, is servable in myriad different ways, and there are just so many uh, 
options people have when one thing gets more expensive, you can switch to something else and get almost the same benefit. So, so yeah, I think that's been long a central theme in economics. Anybody else have something? You don't have to say anything. You know. I got a bunch of things I can say. Um, I'm Andreas Agus. Um, I'd like to get back to what's really fundamental about the financial crisis we're in now. And that is everybody throws terms around like derivatives, this, that, and the other, not really understanding what they are. And we talk about the lack of regulation led up to this. Theft led to this. And the theft is principally with investment banks that wrote insurance contracts, which are essentially the credit default swaps. That they could not honor. With which they could not honor. They had no reserves to honor these credit default swaps. So that's, in any system, that's fraud. It's already illegal. And that's what's brought, in, brought the entire financial system to the brink that it's at right now. And the, but, the, but, what you're, but the irony there is that the violators are the ones being salvaged by governmental action in most cases now, right? Well, that's the conduct of power. Yeah. They have sufficient <laughs> influence to, to get bailed out. But that's political. That, sure, it's political. Why do you political. think there isn't a legal, uh, legal action being taken? I think there should be. There should be shareholder actions. There should be uh, a lot of There things. will be. <laughs> there, there may be. Yeah, the legal consequences, there I'm sure, be. are far legal, from having been seen. The legal profession will be making money over their heads. Well, they're already developing the next generation of products that are more opaque right now. No, no doubt about it. It's also interesting in light of that, though, to look at the reaction to, say, the uh, severance bonus given to the CEO of AIG. You know, now that the government is invested and is uh, more or less the controlling owner of AIG, you know, we are incredibly moral about our, our judgments made about the financial consequences of their behavior. We're, you know, we're taking the 16 million back. You know, they can't go and reward their top salespeople. And, you know, so we're finally maybe showing some, uh, some, uh, Retributive uh, thinking, right? Mr. Grasso. Hmm? And Mr. Grasso, the real stock has changed. Well, he got away with it, though. <laughs> yeah. Will he have to give it back? Uh, no, I don't think so. He's passed. I had one other kind of question because it was touched on by Larry here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a genetic imperative, you know, at the, the gene level. I understand that. But Humans, unlike any other species, have culture and language, which is another means to pass information down to subsequent generations. Right? So Genghis Khan may be the most prolific human in history, but Shakespeare may have more influence. So it, it <laughs> seems like you can't separate culture and, and genetic imperative here. That's exactly what he said in the study yeah. that was done by the Israeli. Well, this is why many of us do believe in the importance of the arts, as, you know, in society, among other things, including yourself. I have. Okay. Uh, can I, can I you can say anything okay. you want okay. for okay. Damson. Uh, 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 along the same vein, uh, we had the following: uh, we're talking about human beings who are good. Their job is farming, and the earth, whatever this is. You know, the topsoil is going to give them what they need. And along comes a dust bowl. And someone asks the question, were these people doing the right thing? <coughs> were they greedy? Did they know that if they kept on planting the same thing over and over and over again in the same soil, they would be destroying that soil? Well, we end up with the grapes of wrath as the message that they care to give you in a general format, and you know, to say they did. But there's a bigger question. Getting back to the political end of it, where was the Department of, of Agriculture speaking to these people and what they were doing? Oh, did everyone was making money, then? everyone was happy, and then all of a sudden, yeah. came down. It always comes down, and it always will come down. I, I think that's, I have, that's I a it. great analogy because Right now, today, if people talk about agriculture, they'll tell you, hey, we used to get, 
you know, nine bushels per acre of whatever it is, corn. Then, you know, in, in the 50s, we're up to about 40 from selective breeding experiments. And now by, you know, uh, genetically engineering the plants so that they, they are resistant to the herbicides, we can dump herbicides on that kills anything that doesn't have them. We're up to 90 bushels per acre. And by all these measures, this is great. This is real progress. And we're, we're it's even greater progress. creating something real that wasn't there before. Until someone, you know, we, we have some sort of catastrophe where because of the massive monocultures and the fact that they are susceptible to, you know, pests, which can evolve at a you know, much faster rate than, than these plants can with their long generation times, all of a sudden we get into huge trouble and it's a different version of the Dust Bowl. But it's, it's you know, we, we did things where every step of the way it was the right thing to do and, and it took us to a terrible outcome. In anticipation uh, outcome. of that. In anticipation of that, there is the next step that's being taken place, and it's happening every day of the week. It's Which called is? hydroponics. Mm -hmm. You don't or organic earth. farming too. Uh, well, it's not. Yeah. It's not organic farming. It's water farming. Just take a look at your advertisements. You can grow tomatoes in your home. You get the plant, the water, it'll grow. But but it's and very. There are countries that are growing wheat in water today, because whatever the case might be. There are things that can be grown in water, as they proved. Wheat is one, tomatoes are another, green peppers are another, and pretty soon you'll be able to do everything else. That is the scientific brain of hydroponics. <laughs> if, if you got water, you can do it. No, 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 no. no. So to, I want to just bring up something, another sort of orthogonal issue that's kind of interesting. Actually, believe it or not, despite what I do for a living, it's only occurred to me during this panel. But you know, I am writing a book about Facebook, and my expertise is the internet and what's happening there. And you know, there's a whole culture on the internet that we really believes very fervently that this transparency and sharing that has emerged in the internet is the antidote to greed, among other things. You know, that the transparency will lead to better human behavior because of the power of the bottom to police the top. That's a, a kind of a, 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 a article of faith among many. And among those who, with whom it's an article of faith is Mark Zuckerberg, who founded Facebook. And in fact, it's, it just really occurred to me, and one of the things, I mean, I knew this, but it even it applies in this situation in a sense that you have what's in, in particular in the case of Facebook, but with the internet more broadly, underway right now, at the, an unprecedented experiment in you know, this transparency and visibility and the notion of mass sharing as a antidote to a commercial economy. You know, that that is really what is going on and that is one of the main reasons why 120 million people are, and half of them every day, going to Facebook and, and you know, doing something that appears on the face of it to be sort of very uh, uh, insignificant, just sharing a note with a friend or whatever. But because of the viral distributive qualities of that system, uh, it, it has implications even for this discussion and for, for the ability of mankind to, to going back to this, this dual notion of the genetic impulse to be, uh, to be greedy and the, in the, in the social uh, overlay to possibly get along. Uh, the, what you talk about, you, you confront every day as you're walking around on the streets and thanking yourself for fighting your own genetic impulses. That's sort of what is being attempted to be constructed at a global level. I think it's just interesting to think about, and believe me, very few people have figured out what that even means. Uh, there are very few people, aside from those who work at Facebook, who even make such a statement. But uh, it's, it's happening. I think it may be optimistic to think of eliminating all of the negative aspects of any behavior like greed or cheating. Certainly. Just yeah. because in... It's impossible. Right. If there are two kinds of people struggling in a system, two alleles uh, in your terms, then <clears throat> with cheaters, if there, if there weren't any cheaters, then we would all cease being vigilant against the possibility of being cheated. And that's not an equilibrium because then a mutant could come in and, and nobody would detect that cheater and it, he would make hay while the sun shines, basically. And so the cheaters would grow in number until Finally, they became enough of a problem that we would all begin to be vigilant again, and then there would be a sort of an uneasy equilibrium with a mix of the two of nice people and cheaters. So I think uh, you can, through technology, reduce the number of cheaters, but not eliminate them. That's probably not. You know what you remind goal. me of? It's a, just a phrase that popped into my head: <laughs> heed the need for the greed. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it just popped into my head. He, the need for the green. <laughs> There's a, if you look at animals on, that evolve on islands, it's one of the strangest things because it reminds me what you were saying that because on islands, because they're small and they can't support that many animals, you tend not to have predators for them. So you'll have things like lizards that have evolved, and if they're relatively reproductively isolated, they'll have evolved for 100 generations without predators. And the funny thing is, you'll, you'll get out of your boat onto this island, and you could step on them. They don't even get out of the way. Mm -hmm. They don't see you. They're not skittish they, because they've evolved in a world sort of like there are no mm -hmm. cheaters. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, okay, and you have to sort of shoo them away. And, and so I, I think that, that it's funny. Yeah, in theory it could happen, but the problem is as soon as the, the predator comes along or the cheater strategy, it takes over, it wins. Right. So, right. so yeah, so it's never going away. Uh, Vivian Warshawski, isn't it even easier to cheat on Facebook or any other website than in real life, eyeball to eyeball? Um, what, what is the advantage of, why is it more transparent? Well, um, you can cheat in any system, I suppose. But the interesting thing about Facebook is distinct from pretty much any other system that ever emerged on the internet is it's based on real identity. And you can't, in most cases, hide behind an anonymity or a pseudonym so that you are known for who you are. Oh, it's verifiable. It's a different system, yeah. I didn't know it could That's be That's the biggest difference between that and all other internet systems that have existed up to now, which makes it quite different, actually. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, I'm Bridget, Bridget Taylor, and I just had this idea that, um, if I can explain this, that um, this idea of regulating greed that for so many generations religion dominated and in smaller, smaller groupings of people, shame was a way to regulate greed. And so because there is such a, such a global world that we now need to have government regulate because there isn't that sort of moral construct in our culture that there used to be. And so... Well, also, as somebody said, this idea that there's these subcultures within which the values are distinct. You know, the, all the traders that did credit default swaps thought what they were doing were great and they socialized with each other. Right, and there right? was no... And hedge funds, similarly. Right, 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 right exactly. <laughs> so the idea that, that you sort of need the regulation because you don't have the, the overriding sort of culture of morality and shame that used to exist in, in previous... Anyway, that, and the other idea I had, the other sort of thought was this idea that um, uh, greed comes, or let's see, from greed we, uh, we, we take, but, but the kind, the, the idea that there's male and female factoring in and men benefit by pro procreating and sort of spreading their seed or whatever, but women benefit their offspring by kindness and caring and they have to grow their children up to a certain age and so that, that part of sort of female um, nurturing, sorry, nurturing is, a, is doesn't sort of fall in line with that sort of greediness. So you're saying women are less greedy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he said before that wasn't true, or did you? Or it's not like it's true. A, it's a, it's, they're greedy for different I things, but that. in the traditional I sense, yes. You just said. It is true. Yes, yes. They, but they don't benefit as much. The, the, highest status, the highest status female elephant seal has as many offspring as the lowest status female el, you know, elephant seal. Is that sexual? Well, they, they... Uh, I mean... Does it make a difference? That's what I'm saying. For, sex, the, for the sex, females, sex. the, the greediness doesn't have the payoff, so there hasn't been the selection for it. Right. For males, there has been the payoff. But that reminds me of what you were saying before in the other room about Jewish law and, uh, and men versus women. The last thing that I wrote and I got hit over the head about, so I stopped writing, <laughs> was Marriage, Divorce, and Conversion. And it was published, but uh, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> 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 it, 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 it is, it's not a delicate subject. You know, I could say many things, but uh, not now and not here. Uh, yes, as I indicated to you quite clearly, it is mandatory upon the man to be married. It is not mandatory upon the woman to get married. Or as one joked around saying, what does love have to do with marriage? Love is love. And marriage is a woman's corporation. That's her business. I mean, that's uh, supposedly a joke, whatever the case might be. Uh, okay. Uh, and and, and uh, 
I, I took it to the next step and I was chastised for it, but I've been chastised before. Uh, and that is, what is more important, the seed or the receptacle? Simple, polite language, you all understand what I mean. It's incumbent upon one to do. And from that point on, various religions created by human beings in, in interpretation of what this is supposed to mean give you a set of rules and regulations that you will have to follow and that will end up being faith. Whatever that faith is, which is the denomination that you are born into, you follow, etc., etc., etc. Tough but correct. Yep. There were some other interesting consequences, but I yeah, guess we aren't going to get to them now. <laughs> uh, Judy Tans. How do you teach children, young children, not to be greedy? I try to tell my oldest grandchild that any child that has everything she wants is not happy. How do you? <laughs> got to start somewhere. Slow well, down. Okay, that's a, a great I know question. Someone I, who has everything it's one that of the they most for, foremost on, on my mind because I know it's there, and I. I See, I see the consequences. I, I, I don't have the answer other than, as in my own life, to know that it's not a battle that will be finished and then it's over. It's just an ongoing thing. And, and you have, you're being pushed in one direction and you push back. And just because the battle doesn't end doesn't mean you think, ah, oh, I can't win. The kids are, are selfish. It's, that's your job is, is to nudge them that, to understand that their instincts are not necessarily right. And if you take that to heart, a lot of people, half the, the self-help books out there say, trust your instincts. That's the worst possible advice. <laughs> you know, because we live in an alien world, uh, especially as a kid, you know, my, my son Jack, he looks at catalogs and it just it causes this frenzy of, of desire for these things. Uh, but it helps me to understand that it's okay that he has this and just I have to constantly try and take the catalog away and, and you know, redirect, as you were saying, find other other ways to, to push that desire. There Rabbi? was an interesting cartoon in the Times a few weeks ago how this mother was trying to downsize what she bought for her child, taking her to a Target instead of a Saks, and she sees a friend of hers and she tries to hide what she's buying, and then you, they walk away, you turn around, you see this friend with her mother going to the same rack. So it's also applied now with what's going on that kids have to, in some instances, not have what they've always had. And well, yeah. I am not sure uh, that if you don't give the kids uh, th that by holding things back, you discourage greed. And by giving them more, you encourage greed. I'm I not so that. sure that yeah. that evidence is there. Right. Is so, she so old enough to read? Yes. There's a great study in science published last year. Uh, the experimenters gave two groups of people a small amount of money, and one group was encouraged to buy something for someone else with the money, and the other group was encouraged to buy something for themselves, the, the people. And then they evaluated them a, a couple of weeks later, and the ones who had bought something for someone else were much happier than the ones who had bought something from, for themselves. So give, give her a copy of that study. And <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi, you yes. the instinct, the instinct on teaching, uh, it, it, I mean, I, I could say that I know many, many people who have everything that they want. And the glorious part of it is that they share it with everyone else. That is the teaching part of it. I don't know whether it's used or not. But in the, the example that you could give, do you teach your children about fire? That's disaster, you know, if you don't regulate it, you know. The child sees the burning candle. The flame is fascinated by the color. It's the color of the rainbow at times. And, oh, don't touch it, you're going to burn yourself. The mother turns around and two minutes later the child touches it and says, oh, mommy, I burnt myself. I told you not to do it. Along comes the magician and says, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> But you taught them about fire. As you taught them about fire, you could teach them about many other things. Just <laughs> another okay. interesting observation, another privilege of my work in recent years has been, as I know Bill Gates, I mean, looking at the world's richest man deciding to basically give it all away, or most of it, and then Warren Buffett, the second richest man, or at least, you know, they bounce back and forth, 
doing the same thing. You know, that's a very interesting role model that we've all suddenly acquired. Never really existed. You know, there was a certain amount of philanthropy, but this is of a scale yeah, we've right. never seen. I, I, it, actually, Ted Turner kind of started the, the ball rolling, but he I did. Found that very interesting. You've never seen this kind of this amount of money in one hand either, though. So it's a different world. Talk into the mic, please. Sorry, is it on? Yes. Okay. You're talking about greed and you're talking about instinct. And you, Could you identify yourself, sir? Oh, I beg your pardon, Elaine Terrace. And you, you speak to children as, I mean, you talk about children as if they come into the world um, greedy because you've identified this gene. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm having a little trouble putting it into words. But somebody once wrote not too long ago, and this coming from an atheist, but nonetheless, uh, the God gene. And just spell it with a double O and it's fine with me, you know. Um, if there is, in fact, a greed gene, um, and I think greed has been identified here a little too broadly by definition, but, um, then mightn't there, or is there in fact also, a moral gene, a good gene? I, I just leave that as an open. Mm -hmm. Didn't you write about this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've never written about a moral well, gene. No, no I'm I understand, but it's, it's in I your book. It's, um, I mean, it's uh, interesting. I mean, I get. Uh, I I don't really necessarily believe that there is a, a moral gene, but that uh, as I talked about those four different ways of transmission from one generation to the next, and culture, culture, and epigenetics, and I think there are factors that do influence at any point in history what happens to people, what kinds of individuals dominate in the society. And uh, I think that for social cooperation purposes, I mean, there's been a lot written recently on the social brain and the development of the social brain in adolescence, that there is a, uh, a definite reason for survival, that we are socially engaged in certain kinds of morality. So I would say morality is a factor of evolution and for survival of, of, the, uh, of, of the group. Over, over history and whether or not that has a genetic base to it or not, I'm not really certain about that. Maybe you could address that question. issue. Yes, well, you know, uh, but come, come, come. Uh, my name is Justine Diani. You had mentioned the four, and I only picked up culture and language. What are the other two? Oh, epigenetics. Epige and I forgot what the third one is, oh, right offhand, uh, okay. behavior. Okay. Because um, All right. and my other point, say, about fire, is I just believe war and chaos. And I think what's so interesting about the learning in an experience like this is that learning is messy and ugly. It's not always you know, that easy to just define things. But fire is a good thing. It's a bad thing. It's a good there is For me, there is no morality. It is. And there's no judgment. You need fire to um, generate certain seeds, only get <coughs> generated if they're burned. Good sermon. And yet, um, you know, it can be a quote bad thing, but ultimately in nature it is. And sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's bad. And I know in the tsunami, the animals left because they have instincts. We are in organic, we're, no, we're not as in organic space and time as they are. But the people who had memory, the elders were also able to flee because they saw that and said, yeah, when the water recedes that way, it's time to head for the hills. So yeah, some is, knew that if you swim out, you can survive also. Yeah. And you're, you get into the tide, but if you just yeah. sit there and go, oh, hmm, what's going on here? Unfortunately, yeah. it didn't happen that way. Right. You know, that's a, that's a, I think we have to wrap up fairly yeah, soon. One OK, question. one more. Go ahead. I, just want, I just want to know, can we just distinguish between selfish and greed? <laughs> I don't know. Who has an opinion on that? Anybody? Yeah. Did you start with that about greed yep. having a motivation yep. for having someone else like Shadenfreude? Well, it's, it's not just acquisition and being a 
acquisitive, but my acquisition has to hurt someone else. Yeah. Right. That's the yeah, you said that. Yeah, I did. Right. Yeah, I've heard some. You know, the, the, the thing that I just, I think we should, I think we're ready to wrap up, aren't we? Yeah. 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 The thing is that, that I think it's interesting to just wrap with is that what, what you just said before about these things just are. I, and I think that's pretty much what we've concluded about greed and, 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 and many of the panelists could document in their own various disciplines. And yet we are living in a time where, as it was pointed out, you know, there is a meme that's being promulgated particularly by certain politicians actually on both parties, that greed is the cause of this moment we're living in. And we're faced with a sudden need to come up with new regulations. And, and yet, if we don't acknowledge that greed is not intrinsically perhaps the problem, greed is a baseline reality that we have to sort of accept and not try to somehow legislate the, about the greed, legislate with the knowledge and acceptance of the greed. And that, that, that sort of, I don't really have a whole lot of faith necessarily that in the next few months we're going to proceed accordingly. Uh, it'll be interesting to watch, but uh, the hypocrisy of John McCain is quite interesting, in, in which you pointed out clearly, uh, and, and that's not a, too, too good of a sign, unfortunately. Um, so thank you thank all, you. Thank, thank you the panelists. I think it's, it's great. Further information about our programs and a complete archive of past facilitating events is available at philipcadies.org.